Hi everybody, Justin DeWitt from Fireside Games, and today I'm going to teach you how to play Remnants. This is our post-apocalyptic survival game for two to four players, uh, where players are going to try and build up their own compounds to try and fight off, uh, battle each other for resources, but also fight off some dread cards that are coming at the end of the game. I'll give you a little bit of an overview before we go deep. Uh, you have your own compound and your own survivors. You'll be sending these survivors out into either the uh, middle of the board to compete in a race for these resources, or to the side of the board where you'll get loot, which will be how you bump up your loot track. Uh, the scavenging phase is done in a real-time dice rolling uh, competition where players are going to roll and re-roll their dice at the same time, trying to get three of the same symbols. Once you get three, you can take that resource, put it on a scavenger, and bring it back. Then we'll switch to a phase where you're going to buy cards in turn order, spending the resources that you brought back to get those cards. They do all sorts of things like get you more resources and uh, more VP, but they're also going to be the cards you need to fight off the bad guys that are coming with weapons cards and defense cards, um, which brings us to the dread track. This advances every turn. When it's on a red space, you're going to end up fighting these dread cards that come at you. You're going to use your weapons cards to roll dice, and instead of counting uh, the icon, you're now going to count the dots on the die. So you use the dice two different ways in the game. Uh, once you defeat these, uh, uh, once you battle, I should say, these dread cards will move on. You'll fight a level one, a level two, and the game ends in six rounds. When you fight a final boss, then we add up all the victory points you get for cards, healthy people, and combat points you've won uh, and that will determine who the victor is at that point. So that is um, a quick overview of what we're going to do in Remnants. Now let's take a look at all the components so I can explain what all these things are for you. Remnants comes with a board, of course. Well, once it's out, you'll notice the board has a bunch of different areas on it. Uh, the things that are important to note, this is where your resources will be placed. Your bonus tokens will be placed in the areas indicated by a bonus. Uh, the buried area is where old resources go. We'll talk about that later. Um, the board, uh, the art on the board actually does matter. The sandy areas are going to be where you'll send scavengers. The edges of the board here that have this ruined city will be used for looting. And then this X section over here is the dread track, which will keep track of the progress of the game. There are also four uh, compounds. Each player is going to get one, and they are slightly different. Uh, they're the same mechanically, however, they have a different amount of uh, scavengers they start with. For example, Freetown starts with four scavengers and one scrounger, where they all have a different specialist. Asheville has four regular survivors and one hauler. New Eden starts with four survivors and one rummager. And Sanctuary is kind of the odd man out. They start with six survivors, so while everyone else has a total of five workers to place, Sanctuary has six, they just don't get a specialist. They also have a loot track that you'll use to track your loot throughout the game, a place to put a bonus token, a spot for leftover resources, and most importantly, an order of play at the bottom that you can follow to keep track of the game step by step so you don't even need to look at the rules after a while. The game also includes 45 resource tokens. You've got metal, rope, plastic, wood, and cloth, and these are what you're going to gather and then spend later as the economy of the game. You'll buy your cards with these resources. There are also five bonus tokens in the game. They all have a common back and then a unique front. These are what you're going to be rolling at the end of the scavenge phase uh, to get a little something extra and also to end the scavenge phase because when the last bonus token is claimed, that phase is over. There are 37 development cards in the game, and they're split into level 1, level 2, and level 3. You'll want to make sure before you start the game that you've actually separated them out based on their backs. And then these cards are cut into three different kinds of cards. There are defense cards, there are special cards, and there are, in here somewhere, weapon cards. Those are the three different types, and there are those types in each of the three levels of the development cards. You'll also get one survivor card and one training cards. And these aren't cards we actually play in the game. These are actually places where we're going to put the tokens so that people can buy them later in the game. Uh, as far as tokens go, you get 15 specialist tokens, um, and then you also get 22 survivor tokens. So when you're setting up the game, you'll actually put these tokens on these cards to remind people of where they are and how much they cost to buy. There are nine Badlands cards in the game. These represent essentially the encounters that your survivors are going to have when they get sent out to go get resources. Some are good, most of them are bad, and you'll just flip one over, encounter, do what it says, and then move on to the next phase of the game. 
There are six dread cards in the game, and they're split into three level one cards and three level two cards. These are the threats that are coming at the end of every other round that you're going to have to face. Now, you'll only ever face two of them in a game, so you've got some variety in which ones you're going to fight. And these are representing basically the sort of Mad Max style raiders that are coming at you, or in some cases, crazy mutant creatures that are attacking. We'll go over the details later, but just so you know, this is what you'll be facing in the game with some variety thrown in. There are three boss cards in the game, as well as six boss power-ups. And the way it's going to work is you will always have one power-up assigned with one boss. Now the power-ups come in levels one, two, and three, and the bosses are also split, although we keep them random so you don't know exactly what level you're fighting. You can either choose the boss at random, or you can flip it over and take a look and decide which one you want to fight. Um, each power-up is going to give the boss a different variable power, and the bosses themselves have their own unique abilities. But just so you know, there's a lot of variety, given that each time you play, you'll be fighting one boss and one power up. You're also going to get 16 custom dice in the game. Now all the dice are the same, so it doesn't matter as long as each player gets four dice when they're starting. Uh, the dice feature both a symbol and a pip, and they're all the same on there, so you're going to see one of each resource out there. Plastic, wood, cloth, rope, and metal. And then you're also going to see a star, which is used for the bonus token. You'll also notice that different sides have different amount of pips on them, because these dice are used two ways in our game. When you're rolling for resources, um, you'll be rolling for the actual icon on it. When you're rolling for combat, or sometimes for different events, events or for loot, you're going to be counting just the pips. So the dice are used two different ways at two different times during the game. There are 13 cubes in the game. 12 of them are loot cubes, and one of them is the dread cube. Uh, the loot cubes are used on your loot track. Uh, red tracks medicine, gray tracks screwdrivers, and brown tracks scrap. And then the black cube is used on the dread track to track the progress of the game. There are 15 victory point markers in the game, which in are double-sided. They are one on one side, two on the other. You just use it for the right amount of points that you need. Uh, you'll notice they are ketchup packets because, yes, in a post-apocalyptic future, flavor is the ultimate commodity. And then there is the first player marker. The first player gets this flag, and it will be moved at the end of each round to the next player, so it passes around the table as the game continues. To set up remnants, the first step is to take the board and place it in the center of the table where all players can reach it. Then we're going to go ahead and populate the board with all the resources that are left over after the apocalypse. In this case, what we're going to do is put out a number of resources equal to the number of players. So in a two-player game, for example, you would cover up the number two spot. In a three-player game, you'd put out three, and in a four-player, you'd put out four. You'll want to go ahead and do this to all the resources out there. So we've got metal, wood, cloth, plastic, and rope. So after the resources are laid out, the next step is bonus tokens. Now bonus tokens are put out one fewer than the number of players, so it's a little bit like musical chairs. Uh, again, you just follow the number. In a two player game, you just cover up the bonus two spot. In a three player game, the bonus three. In a four player game, the bonus four. Again, with one less than the number of players that are in the game. Uh, now we'll talk about get building the Badlands cards and the Dread deck. So take all the Badlands cards, shuffle them up, and make a stack, keep them face down next to the edge of the board. That's the Badlands deck. Now we have to build the Dread deck. Now this is built sort of from top to bottom with the idea of the boss being on the bottom and the first enemy we fight on top. So we'll start actually with the boss and his power-up. There are six power-up cards in the game, levels one through three, three being the hardest, one being the easiest. For this game, we're gonna go ahead and choose between the level one, we'll shuffle them up and pick one. That goes face down. Then we do the same thing with the boss cards. Now the bosses, again, if you want, you can choose the boss by just flipping it over and picking which one, or in our case, we're going to take one at random and lay him down face down. Next comes the level two dread card. Again, there's three of them in the game. Shuffle them up, pick the one you want, put it face down. We end the dread deck with level one. Again, there's three of them. Shuffle, pick the one. And this time, this one goes face up. So we know right away, this is the first enemy that we're going to be fighting in this game. We'll have a sort of advanced notice that they're getting closer. Last thing then is to take the black cube, which is the dread cube, put that on the start of the dread track. That way we know where the game is going to progress since we'll fight every time we get to one of these red spaces. The next step is to build the development grid. This is done by taking the development cards and making sure you've sorted them into their levels one, two, and three. You'll wanna shuffle each deck separately. Once you've done that, you'll lay out the top three so that you're building a three by three grid of cards. There's our level one cards. Here come our three level two cards. And of course, our level three cards. Make sure everybody can see them and that they're all separated out enough. And you'll be refilling these so you wanna keep the decks right next to the face up cards. 
the next thing then is to uh, get ready for the player boards and the uh, survivors. Each player is then going to choose which compound they want. Every compound is different in that it has a different starting arrangement of specialists and survivors, but they're all the same otherwise. You can either pick the one you want, or if you want to just hand them out randomly, you can do that as well. Uh, once you've got that, you'll want to take your cubes. You'll need one red cube to track medicine, one gray cube for screwdrivers, and one brown cube for scrap. Once every player has all their specialists and their cubes, the next thing they're going to need is dice. Each player gets four dice. And once that's done, we'll talk about the last final bit of setup before we can get started. After each player has set up their compound, you want to take the leftover survivors and put them on the survivor card, and any leftover specialists you want to put onto the training card. That way these are available for purchase later in the game. Uh, also, take all your leftover resources and put them in a pile that you'll be able to reach. You'll be refilling the board after every round, so you want access to these. Also, the bonus tokens that aren't being used are kept off to the side. You want to take all the victory point tokens and leave them over somewhere uh, nearby where either one person can hand them out or everyone can reach them. And lastly, you're going to want to pick a starting player and give that starting player the first player marker. Now we're ready to get started. So in order to make things a little simpler to see, we've changed this to a two-player game. That means there's fewer resources and there's also only one bonus token. So Freetown and New Eden will be our two sample compounds that we're using for this example. So the first part of the game is the scavenge phase. This is where you're going to send your people out to get resources and go looting. Uh, you decide how you want to send your people out by committing scavengers either to the desert to be part of the scavenging team that will fight for these resources, or send them to the edge of the board where the ruined city is on either side of the board. That's for looting. So again, scavenging is where you're going to get the rope, metal, wood, plastic, and cloth you need to buy development cards. Loot is where you're going to bring back loot that moves up the cubes on your player board. It essentially gets you more loot. And they're gathered in two different ways. Uh, you'll be rolling dice in a real-time resource race to get the resources in the scavenging phase. The loot phase is a little different in that you'll roll one die for every person you send looting, and you'll be counting the pips. So you'll bring back either one, two, or three pieces of loot for each person sent. So you may want to and more. Now, one thing that comes up on this is specialists. Every uh, compound has either a one specialist or an extra regular survivor, and the specialists all have a different ability they bring to you. So let's take a closer look at that real quick. So there are three different types of specialists in the game. The first one we'll talk about is the hauler. The hauler brings back two resources instead of the normal one. Now you still have to roll three of a kind for each resource, but they can carry two resources they bring back at the end of the scavenging phase. The scrounger uh, will be able to grab a resource when they roll two of a kind instead of three of a kind. So it only takes a pair for them to get a resource. Now everyone else on the same team as the scrounger still has to roll three of a kind. It's just the scrounger that has that ability. Last up is the rummager. The rummager is a loot specialist. When they are sent looting, they will bring back plus one to your loot roll, which means you can never bring back less than two when you send a rummager looting. So very nice to have to get yourself some extra loot. And that is how these three work. All right, so Freetown is going to commit their scavengers as well. And there's no limit to the number of uh, scavengers that you can send out to go scavenging or looters you can send looting. It's just a matter of how many people you have. In this case, let's go ahead and we will send four scavengers and one specialist from Freetown and then one looter, whereas New Eden will send three scavengers, their loot specialist, the rummager, and uh, another uh, uh, looter over there. Uh, once everyone is set up, uh, then you're um, just about ready to go. Uh, remember that every person you commit is only going to bring back one resource when they go scavenging, and it's one roll of a die for each person that goes looting. So what's going to happen is when we're ready to commit, we're going to start rolling dice in a real-time race, meaning uh, the player for New Eden and the player for Freetown are playing at the same time. There are no turns. They're going to roll their dice, um, all four dice, and they're going to try and re-roll in any way you want. You can re-roll as many as you want, as few as you want. You can roll a single. You can can reroll them all again. Um, what you're trying to get is three of a kind. So you're going to roll and roll and roll as fast as you can, trying to get the resource you want. In this case, I just got wood. You would then call out wood, taking that resource and putting it on one of your scavengers. As soon as that's done, you do have to pick up all your dice and reroll. You can't save any between rolls, trying to get more resources. There, I would have just gotten some rope right there. When you're done with that and you've filled up all of your scavengers. Now you can actually do this before, but it makes more sense. I'll explain in a second to do it um, when they're all full. Then you can go for the bonus token because the bonus token is what triggers the end of the scavenging phase. You do that by rolling three 
stars. When you can roll three stars, you can take a bonus token. Uh, when you do that, however, you're gonna take the bonus token, put it on the section of your player board that says bonus, but that's it. You can't scavenge anymore, you can't get any more resources. That's why I was suggesting you wanna do it after you've filled up all your people. However, there is a tactical advantage in shutting down this phase before your opponent has all their goods, so there is some strategy in how you wanna play that. You can take a bonus token anytime you roll three stars, just remember it does end your scavenging. Another thing to remember, just because you rolled three of a symbol, you don't have to take that resource if you don't want it. You can re-roll and just get what you really, really want, which will help you in the buy phase. But before we actually begin rolling, we still have to deal with the Badlands card and the Dread Track. After all the scavengers have been committed, it's time to flip over the top Badlands card. Your people went out into the radioactive wasteland and this is what is waiting for them. Some of them are good, a lot of them are bad. We're going to flip over the top one and oh, it's Carnivorous Plants. So. Maybe a little hard to see there, but it says we have to injure one looter. Now that means we actually have to take one of the people that were sent to the city and injure them, which means flipping them over to show their injured side. Injured people can still function. We're still gonna get loot for the people we sent looting. However, injured people are a little closer to death. If they get injured again, they're dead and out of the game. They go back into the source pile. Um, so this is where you'll wanna consider getting medicine to heal your looters. The other thing to consider is if a um, specialist ever gets injured, in this case, we have the uh, rummager who's a specialist at loot. If I were to injure this person, they wouldn't get their special ability. So he wouldn't get me that extra plus one when I'm rolling loot dice. So I'm going to keep him healthy and injure this other person. And that takes care of Badlands cards. Now we are going to advance the dread track, which means literally push the cube one space further. Since this is the first round of the game, we're on the first gray space. So nothing's going to happen, but we will be fighting uh, the biker bandits on the next turn. Uh, this is done. So then now we would go ahead and jump into the dice rolling phase. And we're going to show you what that actually looks like when two players are playing simultaneously. All right, so when all the players are ready, the first player is the one who starts the uh, uh, scavenge phase. So since that's me, I'm gonna say ready, one, two, three, scavenge. Ooh, rope. You can re-roll your dice in any combination, trying to get that three of a kind. Oh boy. There we go, uh, cloth. You call it out so the other players know the resources are dwindling. And so we get some metal. Rope. Oops, that was metal. Uh, metal. So I'm done. I'm going to start trying to roll for uh, the bonus token, which means I need stars. So I got one star, two stars. Stars, bonus token. So when the bonus token is taken, that ends the round. Even if the other players still had uh, scavengers they needed to fill, um, they didn't get it. Now, if she was full and had gotten all her scavengers, uh, she wouldn't uh, get anything else. But there is a rule where if you have at least one scavenger that didn't get um, a resource, you get one of whatever is left out on the board for one scavenger only. It wouldn't matter if she had 10 empty scavengers or one, you just get one resource. So it's kind of a way to make up for missing that gap. Uh, so that ends the real time phase of um, uh, trying to get the scavenging, now we switch to the loot phase. Loot is based on the number of players we, we sent out. So I sent two people looting, I'm gonna roll two dice. She sent one, she's gonna roll one, and now we're just gonna add the dots. She had a much better roll than I did. <laughs> I rolled two ones. My looter specialist though, the rummager, gets me a plus one. So I have a total of three loot. Um, you rolled a two, so you have two loot. So now we'll decide how we wanna bump them up on our cards, on our, excuse me, on the loot track. So now that we know how many loot points we're dealing with, we get to decide how we want to spend those. The way it works is for every point of loot you have, you can move one of your three cubes up the loot track one space. Uh, in this case, we have three types of loot we're dealing with. There's medicine, which is used to heal people. Screwdrivers are used to get extra pips on the dice, which is most commonly used for combat. And scrap lets you spend scrap points to generate wild resources. Medicine is spent at a rate of one to one. Spending one point of medicine in the future on the heal phase will heal one injured uh, survivor. Um, the uh, medicine, I'm sorry, excuse me, screwdrivers are spent at a rate of two to one. It takes two screwdrivers to generate one extra dot when you're using for combat or whatever. Same with scrap. Scrap is two to one. So you're going to have to spend two scrap to make up for one wild resource. This is really handy if, for example, I didn't get a plastic and I needed to spend plastic, I could spend two points of scrap and I would get a plastic like that. It would count as a wild resource. So I have a total of three loot that I can spend from my two points I rolled in dice and plus one from my rummager. I'm going to go ahead and since I know I need to get um, some healing going, I will put two points into medicine and then I will put one point into scrap, which will get me halfway to a point of scrap, not really useful this turn. Um, Sam rolled two, so she can move her cubes any way she wants. 
There you go, a little bit of everything. Now you'll notice that medicine is built a little different than scrap and uh, screwdrivers. There are two zeros on the uh, medicine track. This is to represent how hard it is to find good medicine. The nice thing is if you ever spend your last one medicine, you only go to the top zero. You'll never go back to the starting zero on medicine. When you're using screwdriver and scrap, you will go all the way to zero when you spend it. So keep that in mind as you're getting loot. And this also may give you an idea of why it's good to send people looting, in some cases a whole bunch of people looting, to get what you need later in the game. Game. The last step of the scavenge phase is to bury all the remaining resources. So this is the idea that these resources are sinking into the sand. We move them into the middle of the board where it says buried. They will be available to be grabbed next turn, but the idea is um, sometimes there's going to be changes in the amount of resources on, on the board. There may be more, there may be less, and this allows some of the leftover resources to stay in play a little longer. Um, after that, we are moving on to the build phase. So one of the first things we do is we take our people back, all the people that we sent out um, come back to their base, and you keep all the resources that you brought because now we're going to spend those resources um, to buy uh, development cards. So once everyone has all their stuff back, this part is not done in real time. This is done in turn order. And since New Eden is the starting player, they will get to buy first. So now let's take a look at development cards. So development cards are where you're going to enhance your compound. You're going to buy these cards to get you all the good things you need in the game, whether it's more resources, more points, or to get ready for the battle that's coming. There are three types of defense, or, excuse me, uh, development cards in the game. Uh, weapons cards have this little saw blade type treatment, and they're the ones you're going to use to fight the dread cards when they attack. The way that works is they have a fist icon on it, and then usually some special text they give you. The fist represents one roll of one die, and in this case, instead of counting the resource, you'll count the dots. So that means this card, when you're rolling it for combat can do anywhere from one to three points of damage. You're going to want multiples to hit the guys with more and more points. So more weapons equals more dice to roll, which usually equals a better chance to do some actual damage. Plus, a lot of these cards have a special ability. For example, this slingshot says that I can discard it if I want and get an additional plus two damage to something, but it would mean getting rid of a card. Every card also has its victory points in the corner there. Those are the ketchup packets, because of course ketchup is the ultimate commodity in the future, flavor. Uh, and then of course the cost at the top. So to buy that slingshot, it would cost one rope, two plastic, and one cloth. Some cards you'll notice will have an asterisk on it. That just means it costs one additional resource of any of your choice. It can be anything. It can be a duplicate of the ones already listed. It can be something brand new. You could even pay for the asterisk cost with two scrap, because remember, scrap is wild. So there's a lot of ways to cover it. It just costs one extra. The other types of cards we're going to talk about real quick are the defense cards. They have this metal plate across the top, and they have blue shields on them. The way that works is blue shields are applied as defensive to the health of the attacking dread card before you even do combat. Essentially, since this has two shields on it, it would be a minus two. So with the biker bandits that are coming are a four-point monster. If you had the wood fence, you'd apply the two points before you even fought, bringing them down to only two points. That would mean if you had a weapons card, you'd only need to roll two pips to be able to beat them. So again, a combination of defense and weapons is going to be really good for fighting off the bad guys. And again, every point, every card is also worth victory points. The last type of card are the specials. These have this sort of patinaed copper up here, and they are going to break the rules and give you all sorts of other things. These two down here are resource generators, meaning if you own the scrap pile, you will get one free metal resource during the build phase, and that happens every turn. You can only use it once. In fact, every development card can only be used one time, but you'll get that um, each time. Same with the spool. This would generate one rope. We can look at a couple of different ones like this workshed up here. This would let you turn one resource you have into two of that resource, literally doubling something of what you have. There are many versions out there. They all do all sorts of great things. The cards are split into levels one, two, and three, which generally will get more expensive and more powerful as they go up. But here's the great thing. You can buy from anywhere in this grid. This is just this three by three grid that you're allowed to buy from um, anytime you want, as long as you can afford it. You pay the cost shown on top. For example, the, you know, the rope, the two plastic, and the cloth. You take the card. You um, spend the resources by putting them back in the supply, and then you flip over a new one to replace it. So no matter what turn order you're buying in, you will always be the first person to have a chance of buying something in this game. The other option you have during the build phase is you can actually get more people. So if you, for example, could pay one rope and one cloth, you can acquire a new survivor. We like to think of it as offering them clothing. They decide to come stay with you. You pay the resources, you take the survivor, and add them to your tribe. Another option you have is to upgrade existing healthy survivors in training them to become specialists. So what you need to do is pay one metal, um, yeah, one metal, one plastic, and one wood, and then it requires a healthy survivor. You can't use an injured one. You can only 
to use a healthy one. You trade them in and take one specialist of your choice. Again, getting a hauler, a scrounger, or a rummager, and then adding them to your team. Uh, keep in mind, they're also worth victory points at the end of the game. Each healthy person is one point, each healthy specialist is two, plus you get the ability for specialist. So when you're buying, you have a lot of things you can uh, spend your resources on to get you an advantage. So now we're in the build phase, so it's time to think about what we want to actually buy. In this case, I have cloth and rope. I'm going to go ahead and spend both of those, which means returning them back to the source they came from. And I'm going to take a new survivor to get me more workers, always good in a worker game. And then I'm going to use the double or bonus token I have to double my remaining metal, which means I will actually have two metal uh, at the end of this round. And the bonus token goes back being spent. Um, and that's uh, the, my uh, first buy phase. Uh, it goes around the table, everyone having a chance to buy until everyone passes. So if I have enough resources, I might be able to buy something on the next uh, turn. But let's see, we pass along. Uh, the next player over here for Freetown has enough to actually buy the spool over here, which will generate rope. So that costs one wood, one metal, and one of anything. Let's go ahead and use the claw, or excuse me, the rope for that. We spend those resources. The spool card now goes to that player. We'll keep that over there. And we replace it with the newest one, which is a club. Now, technically, New Eden has another chance to buy. Unfortunately, with only two metal and no scrap to make up for any wild, there really isn't anything out there they can buy, so New Eden was passed. Going back to Freetown, all they have left is some plastic. So again, it looks like both players are passing. That's pretty typical for the first turn in the game. So this would end the uh, build phase. Now the trick is, at the end of the build phase, you can only keep four resources. That's what the resource slots are for. Um, don't let that confuse you though. You can bring back as many resources as possible. You can only keep four at the end of the build phase, which is where we are now. So this would then bring us on to the fight phase. For the fight phase, you want to check and see where you are on the dread track. In this case, we're on a gray space, which means there is no fight, so we can essentially just skip the fight phase and move on to the next phase. If we were on this red spot, though, we would have to fight these biker bandits. But in this case, nope, that'll be next turn, which brings us to the heal phase. The heal phase is where you now get to spend any medicine you have and heal any injured survivors that you have. So looking over here at New Eden, New Eden does have one unit of medicine, so go ahead and spend that one point of medicine and heal our one injured person. Freetown, however, does not have enough medicine yet, so this person's going to have to stay injured. As we said before, injured people can still be sent out and will perform just fine. The danger is if they get injured again, they're out of the game and they go back to the source pile. So uh, once everyone has uh, spent any medicine they had and healed, we move on to the cleanup phase. In the cleanup phase, we're going to get the game ready to start again on the next turn, which will start with another scavenge phase. The first thing we do is we refresh our cards. So that would mean if, for example, Freetown had used their spool card, uh, we would now reset it to show that it's going to be usable on the next build phase. The other thing to watch out for is there are some weapons cards that will generate resources during this phase. When they refresh, for example, the hammer will generate one scrap to whoever owns it, the club generates one medicine, and the axe generates one screwdriver. So if you have those cards, Cards, now is when you would get that free uh, loot from these cards. Uh, the next step after that is to start reloading the board with the resources we need. It's a two player game, so that means we're going to need two metal, two wood, two rope, two plastic, and two cloth. And the last part then is to take a new bonus token at random. In this case, it's the Wanderer, putting that in the bonus section. Uh, one thing we've noticed uh, in playing to speed things up if you want, when you are in the build phase and you're paying your resources, if you can keep track of it, you can actually refill the outer ring here of resources and that saves you a step during the cleanup phase. Not a big problem either way, it just might save you a little bit of time when you're playing. Once everything is reset and ready to start, the last thing we do is we pass the first player marker. In this case now, Freetown will be the first player and we will start with a brand new scavenge phase and repeat this entire cycle going forward again. All right, we have fast forwarded now to the end of the second uh, round. Uh, we all went scavenging, we all went looting, we got some new cards, we have some weapons. Um, we're done with the build phase, which means we are onto the fight phase. And now because we are on the first of the red dot on the dread track, we are gonna have to fight the first level one uh, dread card, which in this case are the biker bandits. So here's these guys. 
They are a four point health bad guy, uh, level one, and they're gonna force us to re-roll a three dot result if we roll that during combat. If we win, we get scrap. If we lose, we have to injure three people. Uh, starting with the first player then, we're gonna go ahead and have combat. So over here we can see that there are no shield cards, no, no defensive cards, so we don't start by automatically taking any points off. Instead, what we have are two fists, which means we're gonna roll two dice to uh, see what we can get for attack points. One of these, the spear gun, is also gonna give us a plus one, and it lets us re-roll one die. So here we are, we're gonna see what we can roll and if we can get up to four. Ooh, nice, we just rolled Two twos, which equals four. We don't even need the plus one. We have met or exceeded the biker bandit's health, which means we defeated them. So one thing to remember is each player is going to fight the dread cards on their own as if it's their own unique encounter. So because that was a victory, uh, Freetown won. They get one ketchup packet because the biker bandits are a level one uh, dread card. They're worth one victory point. They'll keep that for the end of the game. And now we move on to the next player, each person fighting the biker bandits at their full health. So. If we look over here at New Eden, New Eden does have a shield. They have a single shield point, which means we subtract one from the biker bandits right away. They're at three. Now they have one die they're getting to roll. They have to get a three. Uh, they don't get any special bonuses. The uh, bonuses that are indicated here on these cards, I'll go over later, they don't happen during combat. So here we are rolling, hoping to get a three. We did not. Uh, New Eden has rolled a one. So the problem now is they need to get more than that or they're gonna lose. One option would be screwdrivers. If you spend two screwdriver points, you can add another pip to your die roll. The problem is even if I do that, that's only getting me to two, it's not getting me to three. So that means the bad news is uh, New Eden has lost the fight. So there's rewards and penalties for winning and losing. Because Freetown won, they got one unit of scrap. However, the penalty for losing for New Eden is that they have to take three injuries. So when you take injuries, you have to flip people over. Now the trick is, unless it specifies an injury, you can actually spend your injuries different, um, however you like. This is three points worth of injuries. I could, for example, injure three separate people. This keeps all my people alive. It just means I have to spend a lot of medicine. If I was in a situation where I needed to, I could, instead of spending three separate injuries, put two injuries onto one person, in effect killing them, and then injure only one more person for the third injury. It's up to you how you wanna spend them. Sometimes it will make more sense, usually late in the game, depending on victory points, because remember, healthy people are worth victory points, and sometimes it's easier to heal injured people, fewer of them, than it is to heal a whole bunch. In this case, it's early enough in the game, I'll go ahead and take my three injuries, work on getting some medicine next turn, and call it good. We've beaten the biker bandits. They've been dealt with whether we won or lost. This card goes away, and we flip over the level two to see what we'll be facing next turn. In this case, it's the Plague Wolves. Our level two bad guys are going to be an eight point monster who also is worth two victory points, and we will not be able to heal on the same turn that we fight them. So we'll put them aside. They're scary, but remember, we have two more turns to go ahead and get more weapons and build up our army to be ready to face them when they come. That's how the fight phase works. So we fast forwarded to the final battle in the game. We fought the level two plague wolves. Um, we both were able to beat them. Uh, we are now on the very last phase of the game where we're fighting the boss. So we revealed and we saw him coming and the guy we're going up against is this guy, King Colossal. He's pretty big, he's a 12 point bad guy, he's worth four victory points. He is, however, gonna make us roll one fewer die when we're fighting him. If we lose, he's gonna do six damage to us and his power up card that we revealed randomly is to reduce our defense by two shields. So before we even fight him, we're losing two shields. So, uh, first player will be uh, New Eden. So New Eden's gonna go up against them. We look at their shields. Now they have three shields, but they lose two because of the power up. So really they only have one, bringing King Colossal down from 12 to 11. So he's 11 points of health, we're rolling one, two, three, four, five um, dice to fight him. And we could spend a resource to generate another one. Unfortunately, I'm out of resources, so that won't be happening. We are getting a plus one though. So um, I will go ahead and borrow one die just to make sure I can roll all five here, and we will see if I can get to 11. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. He makes me roll one fewer. So I actually am only rolling four of these. I lose one of these because of his ability. So I'm rolling my four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is not enough to beat him. I do get a plus one, so that puts me at eight. I could discard this card to get to 10, which I think I actually will do. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. That gets my point total to 10, and then I'm gonna use screwdrivers. I'll spend two screwdrivers, which is all I had, 
to get to 11, which is what I needed because of the fact that my shields knocked him down and I was able to actually beat King Colossus. It took everything I had, but I beat him, which means he's worth four victory points. So I get two, two points. And now we go over to Freetown and they do the same thing. Now they have a defensive card that's worth two, uh, which again is canceled out. However, it gives them a plus one against raiders and the boss technically is a raider. So they also have one shield, knocking him down to 11. They're rolling one, two, three, four, five, minus one. So they're rolling four dice. They do get a plus one and the ability to reroll one. So let's see if they can get to 11. Move those dice aside. One, two, three, four, five, six. Plus one means a seven. They can reroll one. Let's reroll this. <laughs> Eight, that's not that great. Um, if they spend all of their uh, screwdrivers, that would only get them to 10. That means they're not going to be able to pull off the victory. There's nothing else they can do. They don't have anything else they can cash in. So unfortunately, they are going to lose to King Colossal. They have to take six injuries. And again, those injuries can be spread however they want. Well, we probably want to go ahead and injure everybody. So one, two, three, four, five, and then somebody else has to take a sixth injury. We will do it to a regular person. Sorry, regular person, you couldn't survive the apocalypse. They are gone, but that is it. Now everyone has had the chance to fight the boss and we see where we're at. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and count victory points. So we're gonna do the math on this. Oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me back up. There's a heal phase. We get one more chance to heal. Freetown does have one unit of medicine. So they're gonna use that and they're gonna wanna heal one of their specialists because they're worth more points. There we go, special comes up. New Eden was rolling in medicine, so they are gonna spend one, two to heal these two back up. And that's all they got. So now we do the math for victory points. You, um, I think it's easiest to start with your cards. Count the ketchup packets in the corner of each card. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then you get um, points for every healthy, one point for every healthy survivor, two points for every specialist. So that's 10, 11. And then their um, ketchup packets are 12, 13, and 14. So they got 14 points over here. New Eden over here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. New Eden has pulled it off. They have a more secure compound with the higher victory points. Um, so they have, uh, they have won the game in that sense. Another thing to keep in mind, there are some special cards that, for example, will give you victory points on other conditions. This one has to do with having loot. There are some that have to do with how many uh, d uh, weapons cards or defensive cards you have. So there may be another uh, bit of math you have to do when you're adding up all the different ways to get points. One last note, um, in case of a tie, if players do end up with a tied score, there are two tiebreakers. The first is that the people, the person with the most people in their tribe is the winner. If there's still a tie, then it's the player with the most points in loot would be the tiebreaker. So keep that in mind in case you do end up with a tie. There's two ways to break that. But that is it. New Eden has won. They have successfully defeated the bad guys and have the most secure compound. Congratulations to New Eden. So the five different bonus tokens all do something different. We'll go through them all real quick. This is the Wanderer. Think of this essentially as Mad Max. When you get the Wanderer, it doesn't actually do anything on the turn you get it. Instead, on the next turn, you'll send him out with your scavengers to either go scavenging or looting, and he's just an extra person. However, once he's brought back his resource or his loot, he'll disappear and go back into the discard pile to come back again at another time. This token is just a wild resource. When you collect this one, any time during the build phase, spend it and it counts as any one resource. Uh, this this is to loot. When you're done with the loot phase of this turn, spend this bonus token and you just get two more points of loot to bump up one of your loot cubes. This is a random resource. During the build phase, or any time during the build phase, you can roll. Whatever you roll, you'll get that resource. If you happen to roll a star, you can choose any resource you want, and you'll take that from the supply off the board and just add it to your uh, player board. Lastly, the doubler. This means that one of the resources you brought back this turn, you can get another one of that. It essentially doubles one of your resources. There are two Badlands cards I want to take a moment to go over just because they might be a little bit confusing the first time you encounter them. The Nomad Traders are essentially a choice each player is going to have. Starting with the first player, you're going to have the choice to spend two loot. It can be anything you want, medicine, scrap, uh, screwdrivers. Spend two loot and you will get to take one resource of your choice from the Badlands and put it onto one of your specialists. Essentially, this allows you to trade loot to get exactly the resource you want. Uh, you don't have to if you don't want to. It's a choice and it will cost you loot. Wanderers on the 
other hand, you don't have a choice. When this card comes over, in turn order, starting with the first player, you either have to pay two loot and draw one new survivor from the stack of survivors, adding them to your currently uh, uh, sent out scavengers. Um, if you can't spend the loot or you don't want to, you'll have to injure two different scavengers. Essentially, you've met a clan of people that are not necessarily friend or foe until you decide if you're gonna give them loot or not. And then they either join you or fight you. So that's how those two work. All right, so let's talk a little bit about dread cards. Uh, we've got our level one dread cards over here and our level two over here. Dread cards are split into either raiders or creatures. All the level ones are worth one victory point if you beat them. All the level twos are worth two victory point if you beat them. Uh, they have different amounts of health and they all do a little something different. Each of them has essentially a special ability. Uh, the biker bandits, for example, if you're fighting the biker bandits in combat and you roll uh, three pips, you have to re-roll that roll and take whatever you get as the resulting roll. That's their special ability. The sandbag are going to force every player to lose two loot points before the fight even happens. So you're losing some medicine or some scrap or some screwdrivers. Uh, the gliders uh, essentially reduce your defense by one shield. That means if you have cards with shields on them, you're going to lose one of those shield points before you even fight the gliders. Over here we have the turtle bears. They do the same thing, but they do it with weapons. They're going to take away um, one of your weapons, meaning you're going to roll one fewer dice when you fight the turtle bears, despite however many cards you might have. The Plague Wolves uh, work a little bit different. They don't have any special effect while you're fighting them, but at the end of that turn, no one can be healed. Essentially, when the Plague Wolves come out, you're gonna skip the heal phase that round. Lastly, the War Caravan. Kind of like the Gliders, but a lot worse. They take away three of your shields when you're fighting them, so watch out, they're pretty nasty. Let's talk a little bit about boss cards and boss power-up cards. Uh, three bosses in the game, King Colossal, the Duke, and the Scream Queen. All the bosses are worth four victory points if you beat them, and they all have a different amount of health. They also each have their own unique uh, starting or special power, and don't forget, bosses are considered raiders if you have a card that cares about whether it's a raider or a creature. So King Colossal is going to take away one of your dice that you roll when you're fighting him. The Duke comes with a second power-up card, so he's always gonna attack you with two. And then the Scream Queen is gonna force you to injure two specialists even before you fight her. They also all, if you notice, they don't have any reward, they only have a penalty uh, for losing to them. King Colossal will cause six injuries, the Duke um, forces you to discard a defensive card and deals four injuries, the Scream Queen makes you lose three loot and deals four injuries. In addition to that, of course, we've got our level one, our level two, and our level three boss power-ups. Level ones are probably some of the simpler ones. Uh, the grappling hook over here reduces your total defense by two, again, meaning you're gonna have to take away two shield points. Body armor just increases the health of the boss by two points. Stink bombs, before fighting, everyone is going to lose two uh, medicine points on their loot track. Uh, grenades, uh, you're gonna have, everyone's going to have to injure uh, three or take three injuries. Battering ram gets pretty serious now. Before fighting, players are going to have to discard either a, a defensive card or a weapon card. And then lastly, bodyguard. Bodyguard is essentially like another boss you have to fight. It's a 12-point boss you fight before you fight the actual boss. And if you lose, he'll deal two injuries as well. So that's how all the different bosses and their power-ups work. Well, there you have it. That is how to play Remnants. Uh, it's two to four players, plays in just about an hour. We are very excited to see what y'all think of this one. It's a little something different for us and we're very, very pleased with it. Uh, if you like this game and you wanna know about how to play anything else we make, we have a ton of how to play videos. You can literally get one of these video rule books for any of our games if you click the link up there. Uh, if you wanna follow us along, we have our, of course, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We also do a once a month newsletter that'll keep you up to date with everything we uh, are coming out with, any news we have. And uh, you can get that from our website firesidegames.com. Just sign up right there. We'll get you all hooked up. Uh, other than that, we hope you all have a great time. We're very excited to see what you think of this, and we'll see you at the next gaming table. Bye! The game includes nine Badlands cards, which are all uh, random and different. Uh, whoa, that's a really dumb thing to say. <laughs> <laughs>